<sighs> All right. Genie? Don't hurt him, Genie. I wish to become a successful YouTuber. Back up, boy. I need some room to work. I'm about to fabulize you. Eight months after opening a YouTube channel and working part-time for a very successful YouTuber, this is everything I learned about YouTube, how to do it the right way, how to get started, how to avoid costly mistakes regarding gears and operation, especially things that hardly anyone has ever mentioned on this platform and I had to learn the hard way. So stick around because I can guarantee some mistake I mentioned will likely to happen to everyone during their very first attempt on YouTube. This is the structure of the video. You can also check the timestamp to jumpstart where you think you need. And yes, I do recommend including timestamp in your video because if your viewers want a quick answer for a certain matter, they can quickly get that answer and improve their satisfaction, which improves engagement and saves time. So that's exactly what I did. But for beginners, especially those who are still not yet to open their own channel, I recommend starting from the very beginning because the first part of this video is gonna be about a few basic but useful insights. Disclaimer, I do not want this video to be just another video you watch to hype yourself up like um, uh, just one more research video then I will get started. No, by the end of this video, you either finished setting up your own YouTube channel, written down a list of 50 video content ideas or at least start writing a complete YouTube script. So fire up your laptop while watching this. How you want to do it is up to you. Okay, firstly, I want to acknowledge your procrastination of even uploading the very, very first video of yours. Though you keep thinking to yourself, I think you can make it on YouTube. I admit I did watch somewhere around 40 videos about um, Mr. Beast advice, how to get started, things I would have done differently if I were to start YouTube in 2022, 2023, until I finally did actually upload it, my first video in 2024. I did, yeah, I, I admit, look at other younger YouTubers who have hundreds of thousands of subscribers and making millions of dollars and thinking to myself, if only I had started earlier or started a YouTube channel during COVID, it would be so much easier because I could have blown up way easier because everyone was at home and had nothing better to do but watching TV. Is it too late now? Answer is no short and simple. I don't recommend you to watch a topic explaining why it's never too late to start a YouTube channel of your own because then that's just another distraction and you will just further your procrastination. So do not go down that road. Moving to the main thing, I'm going to help you get started by getting to know you, getting some answers from you and let's be real, be honest and be passionate with your answer here, okay? Think of me as your BFF and I'm so really rooting for your success. So first question, do I need to talk about a certain thing like having a niche, like people keep talking about? My advice, you don't have to figure it out right away. And we will speak more of this in a second, but it's important to explore what you like doing and live recording is kind of different because if you hate doing or hate recording this, you won't be able to do it for a long time. Again, I need to stress that starting is the easy part. The hard part is to stay resilient and consistent to just continue making content that seems like nobody cares about but you. Okay, so my background, I'm Vietnamese. Vietnamese is my mother tongue. I live in Australia and work as an office manager. Previously, I work in real estate. I started doing like mini skit videos hoping to promote my Facebook page and in return land more clients, but the job wasn't going the way I wanted or hope. I quit the job eventually, but that was where I started um, touching social media and video editing. For the longest time, I avoided social media like a plague. The reason is simple. I'm scared someone I know might see me online and know things about me, like where I live, what I do, etc, etc. Anyway, for a long time, I wanted to try my hand on YouTube, but as someone who was online bullied during my secondary and high school, I had the biggest fear that if and when someone who knew me saw me on YouTube, that would be the end of me. Damn. Am I oversharing again? Is it getting too personal? 
you might come across this self-doubt when sharing your life stories as part of your content. In my opinion, be true to yourself and if that story helps um, emphasize a point or is it a necessary mark to your story, then tell away. Back to track, I never got over that fear till I watched enough YouTube video from other creators stressing that nobody cares. But the one thing that moved me past that fear lie was somebody who explained that YouTube, unlike other platforms, only pushes your content to those who are indeed interested in that kind of content. So don't worry about what others think, worry about what kind of content you want to put out there. Secondly, if you set your goal is to become a proper content creator, you would want to have more subscribers than the amount of your acquaintances and definitely the amount of people who hate you, except if you are guys like this guy. So if you don't push through those small numbers and get started, how are you gonna achieve your goal? So after months of self-sabotage, eight months ago, I uploaded my very first YouTube video. Do I wish to make money off it one day? Sure, why not? But mainly because I like to create. My school years, I spend most of it doing plays and writing story. How cool is it to make something like that online, build a community full of people who enjoy watching it and be proud of myself? Some people advise that you need to find out your why, why you want to be on YouTube, to make sure that you stay on track. Don't do it for the money because if money is what you're after, you won't be able to commit it to this for a long term, mainly because you are not gonna make any money when you first start anyway, so on and so forth. But I think it's important to be aware that on average, it takes you two to five years to finally see if this is gonna pay off or not. I've seen all the normal successful YouTubers take at least four to seven years to get to where they are now because not everyone is at Mr. Beast level. So if you are desperate to make money on YouTube and don't see any coming for two years, you're gonna give up at one point. Okay, next question. Who's gonna be my audience? Okay, so I live in Australia. I can speak English, but I'm not confident being able to produce English content weekly. I'm not confident to speak English for 20 minutes straight like I could on the spot in my mother tongue. Do you even know how smart I am in Spanish? So all considered, I decided to test the water with a Vietnamese channel. It did occur to me that ge geographically speaking, this might have some hindrance as I might not be able to catch on fast enough with the current news or trends in Vietnam and if I do want to show certain things, products might not be the same or even available in both countries. Some references might not be on point, etc, etc. So after trying it out for a few months, I pivoted to English speaking content, which I have been doing. And I will explain the pros and cons in a bit, so bear with me. Now let's build your target audience. Are you making content for kids? If not, who are they? Are they male, female um, in their 20, 30s or just anyone in your country alone or anyone who speak English, Spanish, Chinese. Is your content going to be for those who just want a quick, easy entertainment or something else? Uh, it's really important to find out what you are good at. Creating content that deals with a subject that you are knowledgeable of and also interested in will not only make your content authentic, but will also make the life so much easier. And this is the most common easy approach that I've seen out there for people who are just starting out. Next question, what content to make in your specific case? The way I see it, and it also makes sense in many cases, including myself, is that we all start with what we have, what we see and what we do daily first. So say you are starting without having a specific profession or business, like say you are not an interior designer, you are not an artist, to start recording what you do daily, People can always start with what is right in front of them or what interests them at the moment. That is why many people, including myself, started with what I do or eat in a day, in a week, my skincare routine, some before and after, motivational stories, interesting stories, etc. like um, life lessons, what we have learned because we have experienced it. Things like um, X, X, X lesson, I wish I knew sooner before I do A, B, C things. What I wish my teens had known. Home improvement, home tour, DIY, any kind of content to share life advice on any aspect. 
like weight loss, beauty, fashion, travel, work content, so on and so forth. My advice here is if you want to pass that 4K hours watch time which has been reduced, which I will talk about later, you need to make video that adds some sort of value to others, to majority of people like a how-to, a tip and trick video. It makes sense that for majority of content creators, the video that help them gain the most followers and views are the ones about framework, tactics, strategies, the how-tos, because they offer information and people come for advice and actually stay to the end of that video. And if your information is actual goal, they will subscribe to your channel because they want to learn more. In my case, why I was trying things out to see what stick. All the how-to video are actually the one that blew up and are the one that helped me gain thousands of subs and helped me monetize in two months. I can see the benefits of having a niche. It's not just about personal branding. It also helps you grow very fast because you establish yourself as a trusted advisor that people can always come back for more. For example, if you are in the field of fitness, review, commentary, beauty, and even in beauty, there's so many sub niche. Are you gonna dig deeper in hair, skin, or what? So having a niche will also make your workflow a bit easier because you will focus on what you are good at or interested in. And as you are good at something and curious and passionate about something, you can see yourself doing it consistently for a long time. Imagine you love interior design and whether you are an interior designer or an inspired one, your day would be wake up, write script, finish the script, do a roll where you talk to the camera directly like what I'm doing right now, and B-roll, if any, where you shoot other objects. Edit your video, upload your video, move on to the next video where you already know what topic you're gonna do um, or research more about. And confident doing the research and the writing because you have narrowed down what you like to produce. Now, let's try typing niche content in the search bar on YouTube and see what comes up. There will be tons of video helping you explore your own niche if you don't have one yet. Niching down will be another topic for another video and there are so many great videos talking about this. My two cents is that educational content, very niche down content is great, but in the long run, I think it might be not too beneficial because now with ChatGPT and you see there are thousands of faceless channels, information isn't the only thing that people seek on YouTube anymore now that it has been made abundant. I'm still on my journey to figure out my own color and building my own community, trying to provide value for those who seek information, inside tips and tricks, and also for those who just come to see me, who just love to spend time with me, who are interested in my stories. I want YouTube to be the platform where I can connect and be personal with my people, something I yearn for but couldn't really do in real life. So once in a while doing something a bit more personal like spend a day with me, um, vlog your routine. This is the fastest way to show the real you and this is the authentic city where people can connect with you. But if you are a nobody when you first started, nobody cares what you do or eat in a day or a week. However, if you are already set out to do those kind of daily vlogs and you have an amazing personality or a great sense of humor or your editing style is out of this world, then stick to it and in no time I believe it will yield fruit. So again, it's not all negativities, not having a niche when you first started. I particularly like these very first state in this process the unknown, the learning, failing, learning more, getting to know your audience, and actually learning more about yourself, exploring all the possibilities. This is my advice in the case where you don't know where you stand or what kind of content you wanna make. This will actually help move you to the next step, which is actually the very first step and the most important step, because if you get stuck at ideas, um, what to make, you might never upload. Now let's get into gears and from what I've learned, the most important thing which should be discussed first is audio. What type of mic to get really depends on the content you want to make, but I believe on YouTube, having a nice audio will supersede everything else. 
People don't usually comment if a certain clip or image is not great or matching, but if the audio is bad, a lot of noise, the voice is not popping, not trips, is it too loud or too soft, they have to crank up the volume and boom as start playing, people would just click up without seeing all the hard work that went into your video. Why? Because you put them in a situation where it's not even enjoyable to watch your content. They won't be bothered sticking around to see if your content is good or not. So lesson number one before we even get into what kind of mind you should get is that always double check your audio. If you know a certain position work or doesn't work, pay attention to them during your setup because even a slight change in the direction of the mic or if it's get cover, too much wind, too much noise, etc. can ruin the whole recording. In the beginning, I bought this mic for $50 and $2 sticker to kind of customize the look of it. I was doing educational video style, so I would just sit in a room and with this mic in one hand, I feel pretty confident. But two issues in appearance. First is that the audio fluctuates a lot because it's not stabilized on a table. Every time I move, there will be noise and sometimes it gets too loud or too soft. It doesn't capture the voice nicely. Pretty muffled. Overall, it looks nice, but it doesn't produce good quality audio. Second thing, and the audience pointed this out, is that seeing me with a mic like that makes them feel distant with whatever point I'm trying to deliver. Like there was some kind of invisible wall between us. And as a viewer, they want that connection when watching my video. But if you want to do interview or educational style video, you can just purchase a mic like similar like this and a mic stand and have it record stable audio where you sit. That led to my final audio set. Um, the Rode Wireless Go To Mic. I like it ever seen. I did a lot of research before the purchase and I can confirm that it's worth it. Um, I remember every time I consider buying something, I actually spend a lot of time doing the research because I need to make sure it will be worth the investment right now. Everything that being bought right now need to help increase the video quality in any aspect significantly. So yes, I bought a set of two instead of just one in case in the future I want to do multiple people talking like in an interview um, setting. It's just easier that way when I think about long-term use. How do I use it? Here is my camera. I plug the receiver here on top of the camera and plug in the red wire into this audio. When I press record, the audio received from Rode mic will be back into the video so I don't have to sing them later in editing. In the beginning, there was countless time I forgot to either turn on the transmitter or plug in the wire or forgot to charge them the day before. I went on speaking for hours just to find out it wasn't on. So as soon as you got one, put in practice so you won't make the same mistakes. Second thing to note, if you consider using road mic, if you clip it right here around your neck, try not to cover it in either hair or clothes. I know you're tempted to do this. Every single small movement, even from your hair strand, will have a noise to the overall audio. Though it can be fixed in the editing, but it will reduce the audio quality. This is sufficient for a normal talking head or a daily vlog content, but if you need something more specific to your needs, for example, if you're doing uh, travel content, you're in the wind a lot, or you're doing ASMR video, you might want to slowly dig deeper into uh, more specific gears when you are financially ready. The second thing is camera. The camera I use for talking head right now is a Sony Alpha 7C second with a lens that can zoom in and out. I won't go into specifics because if you just started out like me, I don't think you want to jump right into what setting is best, uh, specs and, and all for what occasion, etc. Many of us might not even have a proper camera yet. This is not even my own camera. I borrow it from my workplace from time to time when I want to do a clear, crisp, visual talking head video, which for beginner using a good phone can totally pull it off. Of course, a camera is always worth upgrading when you save up enough, but before that, there are other things I would make a priority to invest in first, which I will list and explain below. For shooting outside, I have my iPhone 15 Pro and a DJI Pocket 3. This is my iPhone setting for recording. If you want to quickly check out, you can pause this video for a few seconds. I'm gonna leave it at the end of this video for your reference. Otherwise, I'm gonna move on to the reason why I think if you like to vlog your daily life, 
outdoor activities, DJI Pocket 3 is a really, really great tool. I'm camera shy and I don't want people to see that I'm recording. So this is my go-to and if you record in D-Log, in other words, raw file, you can achieve cinematic footage after proper color grading. It can do uh, short content like shorts, TikTok, Insta, and a long form for YouTube at the same time. Just instantly swipe up like this, landscape mode, and then turn into a portrait mode. I also purchased together a mic to seamlessly connect audio with my Pocket 3. So check out DJI Pocket 3 review on YouTube if you want to learn more about it. The two things I would definitely pay more attention when it comes to camera gears are the camera focus and exposures. Whether you are indoors or outdoors, whatever tool you use to record, always make sure that the camera focus on the thing that you want to. Is it your face, your hand, or is it on some subject? The second thing is exposure. If it's too bright, too white, you can't really fix it in the editing. And if it's too dark, yes, you can bump up the brightness in the editing, but at the same time, the video quality won't be as good. Most camera has auto focus and auto exposure feature. So choose carefully and make sure to check the footage after you record quickly. You don't want to waste a whole day recording and end up with unusable footage. The next thing is SSD, hard drive, cable and laptop. In the beginning, I was editing on my HP Pavilion Plus that I have been using for a few years. The process is I record on my camera, I transfer the file into my SSD. Every time I edit the video, I plug in my SSD. It's way faster and less lagging. The most painful thing when editing is every second it lags. You can't see whether the audio, visual and effect are in sync or not. SSD like this is not cheap but they are very sturdy. There's no moving part. I just need a good quality cable. It reads fast and the size is super compact. As you can see, look at this, it makes things super easy for me. Again, it's not cheap, but it's pretty durable. I have had this for a while now and it was passed out to me and it has been used for two years prior. So, so far still good. So consider making this investment if you plan to record long hour and editing longer video. Next point is where I make a huge mistake. I usually copy all my material into either my SSD or store them in the library that I have been building in my HDD, my hard drive. I also got passed out this hard drive. It was used roughly two years already. What I didn't know prior to doing this is that HDD normally has a lifespan closer to a few years of uses. It will slow down and eventually break down one day. So when I was um, storing old video, b-roll, travel clip, and building up my library in this hard drive disaster was looming. And yes, I do recommend building a library if you do certain content that some of the shorts can be recreated. Or repeat it or just keep those beautiful shots in case you need to reference them in the future. HDD is also where I kept all my complete upload video. So back in April I went to Japan and recorded everything along with all other material. I didn't plan to edit while traveling so I didn't bring the SSD. I transferred everything from my phone and Pocket 3 daily to my hard drive to keep them there so I can free up space because again, I was in Japan. If you've never been to Japan, you should definitely get the ticket ASAP to see it for the first time and I promise you it will be worth it. Anyway, little did I know that the hard drive was coming to the end of its life. By the time I went back home and ready to pull those files out, the HDD broke. I was quoted 2K to fix plus $600 to buy a new hard drive. And after waiving the pros and cons, I decided to not pursue. And um, though I'm unable to recreate my library and the memories in Japan was totally lost, I learned my lesson. I make it a habit to only copy and paste the files of the project that I'm working on to the SSD and only delete them completely in the original place, whether it's my camera, DJI, or my phone, once the project is completed. You might think that I'm just unlucky, but you never know this thing could happen until it happens to you. So the better you prepare, the lesser chance it could cause you a headache because when it comes to this issue, it can be really costly. 
So to store what I have recorded in my camera, I need to have a small card like this. And also in DJI Pocket 3, you also need a small card like this. They are not crazy expensive, but they will also deteriorate. Look out for size because when it happens, you will know. It will show on the screen. Last thing in this section, laptop. My advice is you work with what you have and around what you already have to set up a workflow that works best for you. However, if you are considering switching up to a new option, I would recommend a MacBook Air. If you already use an iPhone, even more reasons to look into this more seriously. The reason being, it doesn't heat up, everything just syncs easily. Say I have a video on my phone, I can just airdrop it to my MacBook or just open it from the app right in here and have them sync on the cloud. Same goes for audio, voice recording, copy and paste text between devices. I would say this is the biggest selling point because prior to this, I had to come up with different ways to, if I have image, video, audio in my phone to transfer to my laptop, whether it's Google Drive, email, they were all very time consuming. I used CapCut to edit my video from simple talking head to more complicated concept. So far with this MacBook Air, it runs so smoothly and so fast. I have not had any lagging issue even when I edit complicated videos. Even though I still struggle a piece at certain Mac feature because I've been a window girl my whole life. I think switching has been one of the greatest decisions ever that helped improve my editing workflow. Tripod, monopod, or claw. This is important, you don't need a fancy one. I got this one secondhand and a bit broken. That's why after I upgraded, I left this old tripod to be used with my teleprompter. The reason I think you need a tripod first is provide a stable and steady platform for your camera, reducing camera shake and vibration. I try shooting and taking photo without a tripod. It can last only a few attempts, then it gets really heavy and things start shaking and the footage becomes jittery. And the second is that you can precisely control and maintain the camera's framing, angle, and composition throughout the whole recording. This allows you to capture the scene consistently without frame drifting or shifting. You can also use it for panning and tilting. For tripod especially, often include the features like a flute head that enables smooth panning and tilting movements. This allows you to capture dynamic cinematic camera movements that add visual interest and professionalisms to your videos. I rarely use this function, but you never know when you might need it, which is time-lapse and stop-motion. For creating time-lapse video or stop-motion animation, a tripod is essential to maintain the exact camera position and orientation between each frame and exposure. If you don't plan on having a camera right away, and only use your phone, you can start with a claw or something like this. You can easily purchase this on Amazon. It's not expensive at all. If you're recording with your phone right now, a phone stand or a phone small rig clamp, or even something like this little sticker that I'm pretty sure you have seen them everywhere recently, is that you can just take out the back here and then stick it right onto the back of your phone. And this you can literally Clip them anywhere. Pretty, pretty cheap. I think I got this one for six dollars, and it comes with six different color. Teleprompter. Do you need a teleprompter? Totally up to you. But I know I want to do talking here from time to time, and English is not my mother tongue. Do you even know how smart I am in Spanish? Even pros do this too. You just don't notice because they have been doing this for a long time. And unless you are totally fine with doing things on the spot, which is so great because that would save so much time. But for anyone else who are not, don't worry, this can be your great companion. I bought this from Amazon for around $200. You think I have been talking just on the spot the whole time? No, let me show you. I have been reading this teleprompter the whole time right in front of me. It can take some time to get used to because the lens of the camera is right behind this glass and you will need an iPad to run along the script and with practice, you will get better at using teleprompter. There are a lot of free teleprompter apps, but I use this one and I will link them below. I will also recommend having a wireless mouse to 
connect Bluetooth with the teleprompter app in case you need to fix your sentences and you don't have to ever get up to move back the line. For script writing, people use Notion to also organize it better, but I only use Google Drive. It's easy and simple. And as I mentioned just now, I use CapCut to edit all of my videos. I know there's so many um, editing software out there, but after exploring and trying my hands on a couple of them trial, I decided to go with CapCut. The intuitive interface makes it so easy for newbies like me to dive in and start editing videos right away, even though I have no experience. I watch a few tutorials and I see myself editing video already, starting with just talking head videos and move on to more complicated concepts. I've seen pros using CapCut to produce high quality, amazing content like a proper movie and it wows me every single time. As time goes by and I make more and more videos, I learn more about CapCut. It turns out that despite its simplicity, CapCut offers so many editing tools and its built-in effects make it super easy to produce and result like any other professional tools like Adobe, I really vouch for its user-friendly features. Some might think it's just for editing TikTok videos, but with the web version and PC version, you can achieve so much more. In the beginning, most of the features were free, but as of now, most of the good stuff no longer are free. As part of my office job and this side gig, I see more pros using the pro version, and it was around $140 per year last I purchased and so far I think it is worth the investment. Many advice out there is that you should hire an editor to edit your videos. I think at one point where you actually can see that it is making money and can be a career rather than just a hobby, you are financially, spiritually ready, then this is for sure the next logical step to take. But for now, you have to get on this editing thing by yourself. It's actually really exciting to see your ability and creativity putting together a show, a product to show up to the world. Though I have to stress, many times you think this video is gonna be a banger, it might not be the case. It takes time for the algorithm to find your own audience who might be interested in what you have to say. But if your content is the same as millions of people out there and your editing is just meh, not to mention the biggest thing you might have already messed up is your thumbnail and title, then it might take longer for it to find your audience and slowly gathering enough data to keep pushing your content to that community. So lessons is do not get discouraged, keep doing what you're doing but with improvement. Never stay just the same or just doing the bare minimum. Anyway, if you're interested in a CapCut editing tutorial, leave a comment down below because I promise you, even with just one quick tutorial, you will be quick on your feet to start editing your first video already. I wanted to do a full course of everything I've learned about YouTube in this video, but it's time to get back to my office work. I also reckon I stop here and let you soak in the information I just shared, and maybe you can start writing down ideas you can do for your next or first video while preparing the things that you might actually need immediately to start the process. For example, a phone stand, go download CapCut desktop version. I'll link everything down below. One tip is that the length of the video is really up to you, so don't worry too much about it. There is no one size fits all. Some love doing really long video, like one to two hours. Some like cinematic videos, which takes a really long time to even set up a scene so the video is usually between one to two or three minutes. But many times you will see majority of video out there is around eight to 30 minutes. But later, once you start monetization, having an eight minute or longer video will actually help increase your SN money. If you wanna know why and other tips and tricks, mistake why setting up a YouTube channel, video settings when uploading a video, intro and outro, AdSense account, add sustainability, upload frequency, some tips and tricks to help you get past the threshold to start monetization ASAP. Solution, if you get stuck at ideas, music, etc, etc, check out the second part of this video right here. I'm going to go for real now, but I will check in with you to see your progress in a week. And please, 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 by then at least you have started writing a script for an idea or any idea like 
anything at all. Stay.